Good afternoon. Good afternoon to Helen and good afternoon to anyone who happens to be listening. This is the first in what we hope is going to be an ongoing series of uh, podcasts with Transmedia Watch and with Elsewhere, looking at issues in the news. Helen, you had a line about this, didn't you? Yeah, I thought we should call this uh, We Read the Stuff So You Don't Have To. That's far too long. I'm just going to call it the Jane and Helen Show. Right, introductions. That's what we're supposed to start with. Helen, who the hell are you? Who the hell am I? Uh, my name's Helen Belcher. Um, I helped set up Transmedia Watch back in the day, 2009, 2010. Uh, I gave Transmedia Watch's evidence to Leveson in 2012, been involved in a couple of other parliamentary inquiries since then. Um, but I've also stood for Parliament. Uh, twice in a seat where we had a chance, um, so it came second both times. And uh, what else do I do? I used to run a software company uh, until I sold that last year and um, live in yep. Wiltshire with my wife and uh, one of my adult children when she's here from university. But generally um, have used the time that I have to try and make lives better for trans people, I think is probably the best way. Are you going to mention trans me, um, uh, transactual? I suppose I ought to mention transactual. So yes, I uh, got involved with transactual in the summer and helped incorporate that. And I'm now the chair of uh, four directors of transactual. So that's a good move, I think. Jane, who yes. on earth are you? Okay. Um, well, yeah, that actually suggests that we ought to rechristen this as two chairs or half a dining table set because I'm currently chair of Transmedia Watch, uh, and that's, uh, but I also am involved in Transactual. Um, I uh, write, I'm a journalist trying to shift over to the very unlucrative business of fantasy fiction writing. I can occasionally be found, well I used to be occasionally found on stages across the country doing stand-up, but since the pandemic it's been more a case of being locked up rather than standing up. And uh, yeah, so here we are today. And today's topic is going to be that earlier this week, or maybe late last week, I can't really remember which, um, Ipso, the glorious body that uh, regulates our British press, has released a report on how well it deals with transgender issues. And forgive me for prejudging some of this, but I think Ipso, which is a body funded pretty much wholly by the press, examining how well it does on certain issues, rather like somebody marking their own homework, but perhaps worse, because in the case of students, you might occasionally call it in and check. So Helen, what have you read the Ipso report? What do you find from it? What do you take away from it? Yeah, I have. And I mean, Ipso marking its own homework is, is not a new thing, to be perfectly honest. I mean, essentially, there, there's a lot of repetition in the report. Uh, I think in that, essentially because they, they've tried to combine three different analyses into one report, and they haven't done it particularly cleverly. Um, they pick up on a, a theme I think that both you and I, Jane, have uh, pushed in the past, which is how press coverage has evolved, and they identify um, three phases, as it were, which kind of correspond to the pre-Leveson period where trans people were seen as um, deviant or, or fraudulent, to use TMW's terms, through uh, 2014 through to 2016, 2017, where there were a lot of supportive outings in the press terms. So this is the first trans pilot, um, that kind of thing. Driven largely, I think, by people like Caitlin Jenner. And then from 2017, they picked up that there has been a fairly substantive change from talking about trans people and individual stories to looking at impacts on policy. So there has been a, um, that, that analysis, I, don't, I think we would find that very difficult to disagree with, but I, th I thought their methodology was, was very strange and their selective nature of what they thought was important was strange. I mean, one, one of the examples was they talked about the All About Trans uh, Media Style Guide, um, which is fine. All About Trans do have a media style guide. 
Um, but they've kind of eliminated Transmedia Watch from the narrative entirely, which I thought was really interesting, given that our style guide came out in 2011. Because I, I can remember pulling it together and, and uh, Jenny, who was our chair at the time, sending it off to various uh, newspaper editors and so on. They also had a really interesting selection of stories which stopped at pretty much precisely the point where the controversy around Gender Recognition Act reform was manufactured. But they did concentrate on things like um, controversies around uh, the Gender Identity Development Service at the Tavistock Clinic and mermaids and so on. So there were a raft of, of sort of interesting things that they pulled out, which they didn't join together at all. And that, that's what I found very bizarre. So that it was almost like they were looking at things in isolation. So that they could say, actually, we've done all right, when they really hadn't. I mean, one of the things which, which um, I noticed was they, they talked about the use of the term tranny and how that had, had declined quite significantly over the last 10 years which is true, it has, and they gave the reason that newspaper editors understood that that was an insult. But there was, I don't know, there was, <laughs> they also talked a little bit about sex change and gender reassignment, but they didn't pick up that when they were talking about two of the latest stories around gids and mermaids, the terminology was almost exclusively sex change rather than gender reassignment. They did a, a trawl through all the press that they could find, and they found 23,000 pieces, and then they filtered them behind a paywall, which suddenly meant that papers like Times and Sunday Times, who I think most trans people would think, oh, they've not been particularly friendly, suddenly got dropped out of the loop. And there was no understanding within the report of, of the individual biases and agendas displayed by individual bits of the press. So it was really, really strange. You know, India Willoughby being the first trans broadcaster, it was almost like Stephanie Hurst never happened. So it's a, it was a very selective, very strange set of... Were you actually in, um, interviewed by them? No, the I wasn't. I, wasn't. I mean, that is interesting because I was. And I found them amiable enough. But I've talked to other trans people. I've come across three or four major trans organisations who report having been interviewed by them and they've all said that they felt the interviewer arrived with an agenda but they didn't really seem to be hearing what they were saying and I think in at least one instance uh, they fell out quite strongly with the interviewer it, it's and, and that was my feeling as well because the interviewer started putting to me sort of well what if you know parents are concerned what if children who transition might get it wrong and actually turn out to be gay. What if they were gay? And the counter to that is, but what if their trans and you diagnose them as gay? And the interviewer seemed quite incapable of getting that point. I think that's, that's a, a core part of, of the underlying narrative, which we've seen around the coverage of the Bell case, is that the value that people place on a cis person not being diagnosed as trans is far, far higher than a trans person being diagnosed as cis. And that's been, that's been a narrative for years and years and years. Yes, and that comes out. I mean, I look at it, I totally agree with you. There are bits of the report that I would agree with. They totally back up other research done by Transmedia Watch and other uh, organisations that coverage over the last few years has spiraled they talk about 400 percent rise another research report i've seen talks about a 350 percent rise press coverage has gone through the roof that's definite but like you i feel they've completely missed the point and they're, they're going on about last decade's problems last decade was and even then this wasn't what transmedia watch majored on last decade was about respectful language whereas what we are seeing now is almost wholesale a political agenda by the press. The idea that the Times does not have an agenda is, is laughable. I've read the statement by the chief executive of Ipsa, Charlotte Dewar, who is more or less doing, yeah, we've got a lot of it right, we've got a bit of it wrong. And the fact that uh, 
debate gets a bit heated, just shows its um, area of heated debate. There is no sense or sensibility that what is going on here is that the heat is being poured into this debate by the press, by press misrepresentation, and also by press not telling stories. There are so many stories absent from the press that don't suit their agenda. A good one, which we tackled a while back, is supposed debates about toilets. And they're always framed as trans people against cis women. But talk to cis women, most of them couldn't give a damn. That happens within this report as well, because they position the trans community against what they call a feminist community. And actually most of the feminists, I'm, well, probably all the feminists I know and speak to, are entirely supportive of trans people, and it's a really false divide. And I think what's really interesting in this report is the issues they leave out. It's, it's, in, all, in reading all of these things, it's what people omit rather than what, what necessarily was included. And so back at Leveson time, and still today, when talking with other marginalised groups about that, they're represented in the press. The key issue is actually the discrimination clause within it, so, and how it only applies to individuals. And because the debate in the press has centred around what they call policy, Gender Recognition Act reform, trans women in women's toilets, oh, whoa, they don't name anybody. And that means that any discriminatory talk is, is entirely okay with them within Ipso's eyes because it's, it's allowed under the editor's code. And yet that's actually a large part of the problem. And the accuracy aspects with Ipso are, again, in the report, they, they major on about there were only two studies which they considered as feasible, which, which call into question, firstly, the number of trans people there are, and secondly, the number of trans children who, who attempt suicide. Now, the suicide stuff, I mean, I, you know, here I am weaponizing suicide. The suicide stuff is backed up by years and years of self-selected, admittedly, studies within the trans communities, where the figure of between a third and 40% of trans people admit that they have attempted suicide. And that's, that's a repeatable thing. You go through that survey after survey, which asks that question of trans people, you get roughly the same proportion. So, you know, to pick up on one particular study, which seems to be used as the basis, but only refers to 27 people, so it can't be viewed as statistically sound. Well, yes, if that was the case, yes, that's probably right. But you're ignoring the thousands of, of responses to similar surveys which come up with the same sort of response. So it, again, it's a very skewed. And the other one, which, which actually made me laugh a little bit, was they talked about how the number of trans people in the population is about 1%. But again, that's based on a very skewed view. And then they, they kind of define it down and say, well, you know, this particular study back in the early part of the decade showed that there were probably 0.25% of the population was, was trans. But then later on in the report, they start talking about how the definition of uh, transgender has widened in recent years, certainly after 2015, in which case, maybe the 1% figure is more accurate then. <laughs> you can't sort of say, well, this definition we use now, based on the definition that was used eight years ago in a different study, does, that doesn't, it can't invalidate the statistics that we use. No, it's, I have great problems with statistics used. I was involved, I'm not sure which uh, study they're actually referring to, but yes, they're very selective in their studies. And I remember, weekend when I think it was the Times again, I was going back to one major trans organisation and going, oh, we've got an academic who says this study is not statistically significant. And it was a low sample study. And the problem is, you know, way back, I've got um, statistics well under my belt. I've written books on it. I've lectured on it. 
I've taught it. I'm a statistician. I spent 20 years working as one. So I looked at the study, but the Times said they'd found an expert to say wasn't statistically significant. And it was. It was low numbers. It wasn't the sort of numbers I would run national policy off. But it was significant. Mm. And all I could tell, my, my guess is I think I know who they got as their expert. And the person they got as their expert was somebody who writes in the sociology field and has not, to the best of my knowledge, any expert statistical knowledge, but they had a title behind their name, so they could get away with saying that. On the wider stuff, absolutely. I don't think we're going to progress this time into what Transmedia Watch have done, but we have pulled together a massive great report for the um, GRA inquiry on the media, we set out in great detail some of what is going on and some of the tropes that are going on. And this is a lot of what has been missed. And I agree absolutely with what you have to say about how the most pernicious thing about the press right now is if they want to say things about trans people or about travellers or about Muslims or about pretty much any minority, they can get away with it. Whereas if I want to say something about Rupert Murdoch, I better have a decent libel lawyer. And this in turn interlocks with the fact that a great many, many, many people in the anti-trans side are trying now to weaponize transphobia in this sense. They've gone, well, there's no legal definition of transphobia. So anyone calls us transphobe, we can sue them. And whether that is something that uh, certain well-known international authors are signed up to, I couldn't say, but it's interesting just how many people of late have come out of the stalls to say, if you call me a transphobe, I will sue you for life. Yeah, I, I saw one of those on a private forum just this morning right. where somebody basically said, how dare you call me a transphobe, that's libelous. <laughs> Three or four people said, no, it isn't. And then the original person came back and said, right, X. I need you to DM me your your proper name and address because I'm going to send a uh, court summons to you. And it's like, firstly, why would the individual supply that information anyway? And secondly, it's interesting that you have money to throw away like that. It's it. I mean, I think that's a general point, though. I mean, we we. I was going to talk one final thing about the Ipso thing was the use of terminology and how they pointed out that editors would use things if they felt people would understand them but a lot of the terminology we use so thinking about non-binary people and the they singular they pronoun they won't use because people won't understand it and you're sitting there thinking well how many terms have been introduced over the last year around coronavirus and how many terms have been introduced over the last four years about brexit and yet you're saying that well we can't you know Part of the role of the press is to educate people and inform people and bring people on a on a journey to understanding, but you're not prepared to do that in this case because people don't already understand it. And I thought that was a really interesting sort of admission, which kind of slipped out out through the report. That, that feels to me very much like a certain preciousness. It's it's something I want to write about. I'm going to write about it shortly. But across cultures and languages, pronouns go every which way. And people use pronouns in multiple, multiple ways. And they certainly don't use simple pronouns the way we're taught in grammar. But, but the press would like to pretend they do. Or rather, I think what you notice is that when people mostly use pronouns that way, the press are happy to go along with it. But when trans people try and ask for a specific usage of pronouns, then the press complain it is far too difficult. It's really but, interesting because you've got the, the, the kind of example of, oh, somebody's left their book on the table, I wonder who they are. Uh, and, and nobody quibbles about the singular they in that instance. And it goes back to the early days in Transmedia Watch where we worked really hard, had to work really hard with press editors and journalists to stop the dead naming of people. You know, Jane Smith, formerly known as John Smith. And you just thought, you don't do that 
that for other people you don't say Madonna formerly known as whatever she was formerly known as or mm. Richard formerly known as you, you, you accept those names and it's this double standards when it comes to, because because people don't understand well that's part of your job isn't it to help people understand yeah, yeah. okay I'm going to call time there because otherwise it gets far too long and uh, and uh, I think we can come back and talk about this a little bit more in the future, particularly after the Transmedia Watch uh, report is published. So all I'm going to do is say thank you very much, Helen, for chatting to me on this. Uh, well, it's Sunday afternoon now. It won't be when this comes out. And I hope people enjoy listening to us and we'll come back in future to hear more. Thank you very much. Bye.